God some praise in here. Amen. Amen. As I told you today, we're kicking off a brand new series titled Be the Church. I want to welcome everybody joining us here in person as well as those that are joining us online. I, I got to tell you, uh, I am super excited about this series because I think that God is going to give us new revelation as to why the church exists. Why do we get up every Sunday morning, get dressed, get the kids dressed, run out of the house so that we can get here on time for worship? Some of y'all late every weekend, by the way. Let me just say that. Some of y'all late every weekend. But I'm speaking life over you so that you can get to church on time every weekend. Come on. Why, why, why do we do that? I, I believe that as a result of this series, I believe you're going to have a lot of answers to the why we do church. Here's the thing. This year makes 20 years for me following Jesus. 20 years. I gave my heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus 20 years ago, and for the past 20 years, the Lord and I have been on this journey. Come on, somebody. I got to tell you, during this 20-year period, I have absolutely fallen in love with the church. I, I love the church. I love his church. Before I became a pastor, I loved his church. And I want to give you a couple of reasons why I love his church. And one of the reasons why I love his church is because I've seen God do miracles in his church. I don't know, maybe you're one of those that believe that miracles stopped when Jesus Christ died and ascended to heaven. I want you to know God's still doing miracles today. In fact, there was a woman at my former church uh, who went to the doctor and uh, the doctor did a brain scan and found a cancerous tumor in her brain. He set her up for emergency surgery a couple days later, but there was a problem. She came to the church afterwards, and we prayed over her. We laid hands on her. She goes back to the doctor to have that cancerous tumor, tumor removed. Just before the doctor operates on her, he says, I got to get one more MRI to confirm exactly where it is I'm going to operate. Well, he goes in to do the next MRI, and the cancerous tumor is completely gone. Now, maybe you're a skeptic, and I'm going to share a little bit about my story. For a period of time, a long period of time in my life, I was a skeptic as well. But you could only hear stories like this so many times before you eventually begin to believe maybe God is up to something. Come on, somebody. The woman comes back, and we're like, hey, okay, we believe you. <laughs> but could you bring us both MRIs? And she produced for us both MRIs, both the MRI that showed the cancerous tumor and then the other MRI that the doctor did that showed no cancerous tumor at all. It was time stamped with her name on it. Why do I love Jesus? Why do I love his church? I love his church because he is the God of miracles and he still does miracles in his church. In fact, I was thinking about a passage of scripture in John chapter 11. We see the story of Lazarus. And uh, Lazarus is about to die. He's sick. He's about to die. And word gets back to Jesus that he's about to die. And this is what Jesus says. He says, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. In other words, Jesus says the reason why I do miracles is so that I can get glory out of your life. Why, is Jesus, why did Jesus not stop doing miracles 2,000 years ago? Why is he still doing it today? Because he's still trying to get glory. Amen. He's still trying to get glory. I, I, I love his church because his church is a place where broken people are healed. There was a couple that came in here a couple years ago, and their marriage was on the rocks. In fact, they share with me that for the past decade, their marriage has been on the rocks, which, by the way, a decade is a mighty long time for your marriage to be on the rocks. Come on, somebody. So as you can imagine, they were absolutely broken Come to find out, the biggest issue that they were dealing with was that the wife could not stop thinking about her ex. In fact, she started to believe that maybe her life would have been better had she had married her ex and not her current husband. But they had a problem. The problem was they walked into the church. And so they came into the church, and we began speaking life over them. 
Uh, we began praying over them. They joined a group. They got under some good teaching. Come on, somebody. And as a result, if you ask them today, they will tell you that their marriage is better than it's ever been before. Why? Because God took all of their broken pieces and put them back together. That's what he does in his church. That's what he does in his church. I love the church. I love the church because the church is a place where lives are transformed. A young lady here on our team named Judy, and Judy came to our church a couple, about a year and a half ago, and she gave her heart to Jesus, and since then, she's been rocking and rolling, but if I were truly honest with you, her life at home isn't the greatest. She's had all kinds of dysfunction to the point where not too long ago, she ended up homeless for about 10 minutes, and then the church stepped in. And when the church stepped in, the church gave her a place to stay. And now Judy, who's finishing college, has a place, a home to live in that is free of dysfunction. And a place, a place where she can thrive. I had a conversation with her and I'm like, look, it just doesn't make sense. How can someone experience everything that she's experienced and still have joy? How can she experience everything she's experienced and still smile? And this is what God reminded me of. Look at the book of uh, Ephesians. Where is it at? I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. You got it right. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Here's what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Why is it it doesn't make sense? Because the old duty has gone. The new has come. That only happens in the church. So while maybe you love the church because of something you read, maybe you love the church because you've always been in the church. You don't know anything different. I love his church because of what I've seen with my own two eyes. I've seen lives transformed. I've seen people that are broken put back together. I've seen God do miracles in his church. And so because of that, I'll spend the rest of my days in his church. Come on, somebody. These are things that only happen in his church. I truly believe that God's church is the hope of the world. In fact, maybe you've been looking to hope in Washington, D.C. I want you to know If you're looking for hope in Washington, D.C., I'm going to tell you how that's going to end. (laughs) It's not going to go so well for you. Good luck. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. God's church is the hope of the world. Not man, not Washington, D.C., not, which, by the way, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later on in the year. We don't run from hard topics here at Expansion Church. Come on, somebody. Yeah, we're going to deal with this, right? But we don't find hope in the voting booth. We find hope through Christ, and through his church. So while I say that with a bunch of passion and conviction today, I need you to understand that I haven't always believed this. In fact, some of you all, you are what I would call drug babies. Yeah, you were drugged to church three to four times a week. (laughs) Yeah, as that ain't that some of y'all didn't get that one. <laughs> some of like, I wasn't a drug baby. What are you talking about? Yeah, some of y'all would drug the church three to four times a week, and on Saturday, I'm sorry, on Sunday, you were in church all day. <laughs> I mean, all day. Okay, but 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 I didn't have the privilege of being a drug baby. Okay, I didn't. Somebody's gonna chop that one up on Facebook. <laughs> I didn't have the privilege of being a drug baby. No, no, no. Like, I, I didn't grow up in the church. So when I hit the age of 18, I decided I didn't want to have anything to do with God, and I didn't want to have anything to do with the church at all. In fact, I became a full-blown atheist. I was never an agnostic. You know, agnostics are those who are like, I don't really know, so I'm kind of on the edge. Which, by the way, let me just say this. If you are agnostic, let me tell you, eternity is a mighty long time. You need to go and do some investigation. 
It is not okay to say, I don't really know and I'm just going to stay here. No, no, you need to know that you know that you know. Come on, somebody. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm naturally an all in or all out kind of person. And so let me tell you, during this season of my life, I was all out. And I was all out largely because I didn't really understand what the church was all about. It, it didn't really make sense to me. In fact, I had seen bad representations of the church growing up as a kid. And so I decided I don't really want to have anything to do with this place called church. But the thing that intrigues me are those of us who you've been in church your entire life and you still can't articulate the importance of the church. You still don't understand why the church exists. Okay, maybe you're the person who says stuff like this. I love coming to church because I get some really good self-help. Pastor gives some really good stuff. I could read a book, but I don't want to read a book. So I'm just going to come get the self-help advice from my pastor. Maybe you're the person who would say, hey, uh, um, coming to church is a duty. And as a Christian, I do my good Christian duty by coming to church. In fact, I'm looking for perfect attendance on my heavenly report card. <laughs> Maybe that's you. You've been in church your whole life, and that's how you sum up Christianity. That's how you sum up the church. Or maybe you're the person who you come to church so you can get a good selfie. <laughs> so you, I see you in the lobby. <laughs> you in the lobby trying to get a good selfie. Why? Because you want to post it on Facebook and Instagram so that you can virtue signal. And you can tell all your friends, I'm a really good person. Look, I go to church. If you fall in any of those categories, I want you to know you have completely missed the point of the church. And so as we start off this series, Be the Church, I want to spend some time talking today about what the church is and what the church is not. Because we can't talk about being something that we cannot define. We can't talk about being the church when we don't really understand what the church is. And so today, we're going to spend our time talking about what is the church. I want to start out in the book of Acts. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse number 42. We're going to start at 42. We're going to read through 47. Here's what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Okay, let me give you some context. This is the first church. Like, this is the very beginning. The very beginning. The church has been in existence for 2,000 years now. But this is the very beginning of the church. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Verse number 44, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. A couple of things that I noticed happened in the first church. Number one, in the first church, they learned together and they grew together. Come on, somebody. I tell you this all the time. Maybe you've never heard a pastor say this before. But if you're not growing at Expansion Church, I need you to leave here and I need you to find a place where you can grow. Come on, somebody. Gone are the days where we just go to the family church. I go here because my grandmama went here. Now, you don't get anything out of it. You haven't grown in 20 years. But you go because grandmama went there. Because great-grandmama went there. No, 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 no. If you're not growing, I need you to find a place where you can learn and grow. Amen? Amen. They grew. They, they learned together. Put, put them up here, guys. They, it says they had tons in common. In other words, they had similar life experiences. One of the things that we love about being here in this house at Expansion Church is that a lot of us have similar life experiences. It says they were generous. In fact, we have a core value here at Expansion Church. We are givers, not hoarders. Yeah, we serve a generous God. How can we serve a generous God but be stingy? 
It says they ate together. Come on, somebody, there's something about getting around the table with other believers, eating, fellowshipping together. Come on, God does something special when you get together with other believers around the table. And then they praise God together. There's something special. Maybe you haven't ever felt this before. But when we come into a setting like this and we all raise hands corporately and worship the king together, God does something special in, that, in our midst. Okay, let me give you an example. There is the omnipresence of God, and then there's the manifest presence of God. The omnipresence of God. God is everywhere you're at at the same time. When you go to the bank, God's there. He sees you when you're trying to put that money in, when you're trying to steal that money, yeah. Yeah, he's at the bank when you're at the bank. He's at Publix when you're at Publix. When you're at work, he's at work with you. When you're in the car, he's with you. Why? He's omnipresent. But then there's the manifest presence of God. That's when God's presence shows up and you know see, some, he's doing something, shifting the atmosphere. Something's happening. Come on, somebody. That's what he does in this place. It says they praise God together. Here's what I did not see. I didn't see them mention anything about the building. I didn't see anything that... I didn't see them mention anything about church lights, stage, sound, pews, the podium, robes. I didn't see them mention anything about the building. Why? Write this down. The church is not a building you go to. It's a family you belong to. So many of us have this misconception of what church is about. Church is not about a building. Jesus did not die on the cross for a building. He died on the cross for a people. We are the people. We're the church, not the building. Okay, if you went and bought some Tupperware today, what's more valuable, the Tupperware or the food you place on the inside of the Tupperware? What the food on the inside of the Tupperware, in the same way, it's not the building that's more valuable. It's not the build, building that's the focus. The thing that's the focus is the contents on the inside. We are the contents. We are the church. Jesus died for a people. He didn't die for a building. Are you with me on that? Everything that we read about was all about family. In fact, let me give you some church history. For the first 300 years of Christianity, Christians never met in a building. It wasn't until 300 years after Jesus died that all of a sudden the church building popped up. And then for some strange reason, the church building became the fixation of everybody's eyes. Maybe you've been around the globe and you've seen these extravagant church buildings. The church building was never supposed to be the focus. Now, I'm not knocking church buildings. We have a church building. Come on, somebody praise God. Because we can't all fit in a house. In fact, if you'd like to offer up your house and we can get out, of, out from underneath this rent here, we'd love to come to your house. Anybody want to offer up their house? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not knocking the building. I'm just saying that the building was never supposed to be the focus. It was never supposed to be the emphasis. The emphasis should have always been placed upon the family. Here's the cool thing. So we saw in Acts chapter 2 where the church started out small together. But over the past 2,000 years, the church has grown just a little bit. In fact, it's gone from about 3,000 believers at the day of Pentecost to about one and a half billion followers. So the family is not just those that sit in here in Expansion Church. You got one and a half billion cousins. <laughs> you got aunties, crazy aunties, uncles. Come on, somebody. They span the entire Globe, your family, sometimes I think we segment ourselves in the body. And we're like, well, this is my church, and that's different from every other church. Sometimes we have church competition. My church better than your church. Yeah, look, like God never intended for, for, for it to be that situation. We're all a part of one 
body. We're one family. We're all a part of the same family. Now, maybe you've gotten a little bit confused because you see denominations out there. And you look at the denominations and you're like, well, they got this name out front and they got that name out front. There must be division in the body. Why do they have denominations? They need to shut them down. Here's what I need you to understand. Denominations served for hundreds of years a very important role in the history of the church. In fact, at the time, there was no YouTube. There was no Instagram. There was no Facebook. There were no Google reviews. So if I moved to a new town, the only way I would know whether I should check out a church or not was based upon its denominational affiliation. So they served a very important role, but in them being different, which is a good thing, they do things a little bit different. And that's not a bad thing. Just be, Okay, listen, I don't have to put down what you're doing in order to validate what I'm doing. Like, we can all be a part of the same family, and we don't have to do everything exactly the same. One of the things I love about expansion church is we're like this big tent where we got people who have come from all different denominational backgrounds. In fact, one of the things that we love doing is a roll call. So we're going to do the roll call right now. If you grew up Catholic, could you shout back at me, call my Catholic people? Three or four people. I love it. I love it. Okay. If you grew up mainline, uh, AME, Episcopal, uh, Episcopalian, Anglican, Presbyterian, Lutheran, if you grew up in any mainline denomination, could you shout back at me? <laughs> One person. We're going to get to the really loud people in just a minute. Y'all know who I'm talking about. We're going to get to the really loud people in just a minute, okay? If you grew up Baptist, anything Baptist, Southern Baptist, Missionary Baptist, Primitive Baptist, hold my pew while I shout Baptist. If you grew up in any Baptist denomination, come on, shout back at me, all my Baptist people. Okay, okay, okay. The last group. Actually, we got two more, but this is the next one. If your denomination started in Los Angeles, California, early 1900s, Azusa Street, if you are Pentecostal, anything, Church of God in Christ, come on, Assemblies of God, yeah, Church of God, Church of Christ, Church of this one, Church of that. If you grew up Pentecostal, can you shout back at me? Come on, Okay. I said that was the last one. There's, there's actually one more. If you grew up in a church where they had to have a Starbucks in the lobby or that wasn't church, and the kids' ministry had to have a slide, you don't have a slide? This isn't a Christian church. <laughs> if you grew up non-denominational, could you shout back at me for all my non Denominational people. I guess everybody was Baptist and Pentecostal. Right? I guess everybody was Baptist and Pentecostal. Here's the point I'm making. The point that I'm making is we're a big tent, and regardless to what your background is, you're still a part of the family. But what we oftentimes have a tendency to do is we oftentimes have a tendency to say, well, you don't do it like I do it, thus you are bad. You don't preach the way I preach. You don't sing the same songs I sing, thus there's a problem with you. You got right now on YouTube, you got people who make money by bashing pastors, not recognizing that we're all on the same team. People that are making money by bashing churches, we're all, you will never hear us as a church bashing another church. You'll never hear us bashing another pastor. Why? Because we're all a part of the same family. If we were on a football team or we were on a basketball team, I might not like the way you dribble, but that doesn't mean you're not on the same team as me. I might not like the way you throw the football, but that doesn't mean we're not on the same team. 
Come on, somebody. There is diversity in the body of Christ. God is a God of diversity. Now, you might not like diversity, but God loves diversity. And there's diversity within the body, and that is a good thing. So let's define for just a minute, a minute what the church is. Write this down. The church is the family of people lifting up the name of Christ around the globe. If you're lifting up the name of Christ, you are right with me. We're we're, we're a part of the same family. Now, we might have some differences of opinion. We might have some preferences that are different, but it's okay because we're all lifting up the name of Jesus. We're on the same team. We're a part of the same family. Well, pastor... That church over there, the pastor's a little bit flamboyant. Is he lifting up the name of Jesus? Pastor, you got to understand, that pastor over there, he trying to get a jet. (laughs) Y'all know who I'm talking about. He trying to get a jet. Is he lifting up the name of Jesus? That church over there, you know, you got people falling out on the floor. I don't really know. Okay. Just because you wouldn't go to the church doesn't make the church bad. Just because it's not for you doesn't mean it's a bad thing. In fact, there are lots of people around the globe that certain churches fit them better. And that's a great thing. Why? Because we're not all the same. We're diverse. That's a good thing that there are churches that are diverse. Amen? Amen. Now, maybe you would say, you know, Pastor, you've been talking about all this family talk. I don't ever remember becoming a part of the family. Like, I don't understand. Like, I, so now all of a sudden I'm just a part of a family? Like, how did, how did this happen? Okay, check this out. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 5, it says, for he chose us. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. For he chose us. No, you didn't choose to be a part of the family. He chose you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you might not have chosen this family. Maybe you're like, this family is dysfunctional. They're just a little bit crazy, you know what I'm saying? He chose you. For he chose us and him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and love. He predestined us for adoption. Everybody say adoption. For adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure, excuse me, his pleasure and his will. Jesus chose us and then he adopted us into a family. And that family now has one and a half billion people all around the globe. That's a beautiful thing. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah. You didn't choose the family. No, you didn't choose the family. But God chose you. Come on, somebody. I know we say it all the time. We say, you know, I found Jesus. But in actuality, Jesus found you. I remember when I was lost and broken, when I was an atheist. I like to say, you know, I I went on a search and I found Jesus. But in actuality, he found me in the dark place, in the low place. He chased after me more than I chased after him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, maybe... You're here, and and you will say, okay, all right, all right, all right, I get it, I get it. We're a family. I love God. I just don't love the people. So, God, give me you, and you can keep all the people in the church. (laughs) Give me you, keep all the people. But here's what you got to understand. It's his presence and his people that are a package deal. Like, they're a package deal. You can't have one without the other. I don't even understand you ain't got to go to church to be a Christian. You ain't got to go to church to love God. You're right, but you got to understand that the people that love God love what God loves. And God loves his church. So you can't say, well, I don't want to have anything to do with the church. I'm just going to focus on God because the two are a package deal. In fact, in Scripture, the church is known as the bride of Christ. You can't separate a groom from his bride. Okay, let me give you an example. My wife and I are a package deal. I've seen some churches where people are like, I love the pastor, I just can't stand the pastor's wife. Or I love the pastor's wife, I just can't stand the pastor. Let me tell you something, the two of us, we come as one. (laughs) We're a package deal. 
Yeah, some of y'all, okay. <laughs> some of y'all go to my wife and you try to talk bad about me. <laughs> First of all, I just want you to know, that's not a good idea. She's from Miami, and she's, she got some stuff in her. We've been trying to get it out of her. We've been wor we're working on it. That's what I'm saying, okay? It's not a good idea. Here's the thing. We are a package deal. We come as one. The same is true when it comes to God and his bride. When it comes to God and his bride, the church, they're one. You can't have one without the other. They're a package deal. Look at what the Bible says in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of, the war, of, of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The church is the bride of Christ. You can't have the groom and want nothing to do with the bride. Are you with me on that? Now, maybe you would say, all right, pastor, I get it. Okay. Maybe I do need the bride. But if I were truly honest, what I don't understand is how the bride can hurt people so much. Like, I was at this one church, and then the people, they started talking behind my back, and, and it hurt. If I'm going to be honest, it hurt really bad. I was at this one church, and they were supposed to have shown me love, and they didn't really show me the love that I think I should have gotten. I, I, I'm cool with God, but I just can't do the church. Mm. I, here, here's what I want to say to those of you all who have been hurt by the church before. While Christ is perfect, his bride is not. Like, it's Christ that's perfect, not his bride. The church isn't perfect. Why? Because we're full of a bunch of human beings. We're full of a, a bunch of imperfect humans. Okay, all right. Humans have personal agendas. Humans sometimes have ulterior motives. Humans can be cutting sometimes. They can say things that hurt. Humans can at times talk behind your back. That's just a part of being human. But you don't turn your back on the church because the church acts human. Okay. Y'all have seen before these people that they have tigers in their backyard. They put them in little cages and they call them their pet. Right? Y'all seen this before. And then one day, the tiger gets older, and the tiger rips their arm off. And then they get interviewed by a reporter. No arm. And then the reporter is like, so I heard that Tony the tiger bit you. Some of y'all remember Tony the tiger. Come on, somebody. And the person says, I never thought that Tony would ever do that to me. In other words, the person is surprised that the tiger went tiger. That's what tigers do. In the same way, it would be crazy for us to get around a bunch of humans and never expect for humans to act human. So while I would love to assure you that you will never get hurt at Expansion Church, I just can't. Now, we're going to do a lot of things to lower the likelihood of you being hurt here, but I need you to understand we're full of human beings. The church is made up of people, and people are imperfect, and people are going to make mistakes. Here's the interesting thing. People automatically assume because you read the word that you're perfect. No. I'm still human. I was still born with a sin nature. So while I might be redeemed in Christ, I was still born with a sin nature. And there are times where I might act in sin. There are times where the people in this room might act in sin. But it doesn't mean we don't love God. Okay, that church, they so just fake and phony. We're people. We're humans. You make mistakes all the time and you want people to show you grace. 
you got some people who are like, you know what? I love the church, but I got hurt by the church, so I'm just going to stay away. I'm turning my back. I'm going to stay away. But here's the thing, ladies. There was a period of time, if you're married, where you were dating. And if you're dating, where you're still dating. And when you found a couple of bad men, you didn't turn your back on all men. Well, I hope you did. It's 2024, y'all. <laughs> oh, God. I would hope, I would hope you didn't turn your back on all men because some men hurt you. That makes no sense. And in the same way, we don't turn our back on the church because we got hurt by this church or because we got hurt by that church. Are you with me on that? Yes. Maybe you would say, well, pastor, my understanding of scripture is that the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of me. And because the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of me, that means that I got holy Wi-Fi. And so I have no need for the church because I got Wi-Fi right here. But here's the thing you have to understand. The Bible, uh, Paul, talks about the church being a body. And that body has many parts. In fact, I want to look at this right quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. When you gave your heart to Jesus, you did not just get the Holy Spirit. You also became a part of a body. Look at what the Bible says. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Keep going, guys. Oh, it's not up there. Yeah, uh, some of us, <laughs> some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not the hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not an eye. Would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. Everybody say, just where he wants it. Where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. What's the point I'm making here? My hand is a great hand. I can do a lot with this hand, right? I can grab things, right? I can touch, I can feel. But apart from my body, my hand, my hand has almost no value. Like, if someone were to cut my hand off, it would just sit there. It would never move again. Same is true when it comes to my heart. You take my heart out, it has no purpose outside my body. How many believers have walked away from the church thinking they're just going to do Christianity out there all by themselves, not understanding that separated from the body, you can't be all that God has designed you to be? You can't. So why do we come to church on Sunday morning? We come to church to maintain connection with the body. Because we recognize I can't be who God has called me to be if I'm separated from the body. Maybe you've been here for some time. I want you to know I love you and I'm glad you're here. I need you to understand this place might not be everybody's cup of tea. That's okay. I just need you to go get connected somewhere else. There are people that sometimes will leave our church, and one of the things that I'll tell them when they leave is, just go to another church. Like, I need you to get plugged in. Why? Because you're not effective apart from the body. Here's the last thing I want to say, and then we're going to close out. The church is God's plan A and his plan B. Maybe you started a business, and just in case it ain't work out, you created a plan B. 
maybe you got a new job. And just in case it didn't work out, I got my resume on LinkedIn. Come on, somebody. Yeah, we create plan Bs, but I need you to understand that the church is God's plan A and his plan B. The church is God's plan A and plan B when it comes to bringing hope into the world. If America is going to change, it's going to be because the church rises up. It's not going to be because we elect a certain president. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. You got Christians that instead of functioning in the power and the authority that Jesus Christ has given them, they decided to give their power and authority away to a political party. You got Christians looking for power. Let me help you to understand something. When I look in scripture, it talks about the fact that when we're weak, he shows up strong. So it's not about Christians having power. It's about us submitting to his power and his authority. And then he moves on our behalf. But you've got Christians who have just gotten tired of waiting. They got tired of doing it God's way. So they decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump on the Republican bandwagon. I said it. Yes, I did. I'm looking in the camera. I said it. You've got Christians who have jumped on the Democratic bandwagon. If I could just get the right Democrat in the White House, then it'll fix all of our problems. If I could just get the right Republican in the White House, then it'll fix all of our problems. And God is sitting down looking from heaven saying, no, you're my plan A. You're my plan B. When you rise up, that's when our country is going to change. You want hope? You want hope to come into this country? We need to be who God has called us to be. You want peace in this country? We have to be who God has called us to be. Look, in the city of Port St. Lucie, so many of us, we look to the city to fix the problems in the city. And I understand why we do that. But I need you to understand that I believe that it's us, Expansion Church, Calvary Chapel, Christ Fellowship, Morningside Church, uh, Flood Church, Redefined Church, and any other church here in the city of Port St. Lucie that God is wanting to be the plan A and plan B that restores hope, healing, and peace to the city. It's not going to happen from the outside. It's not going to happen from Washington, D.C. It's not going to be because of Tallahassee. It's going to be because the church does what the church has been designed and called to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so as I close, here, here's what I want to say. Not only are we his plan A and his plan B, when it comes to bringing hope into this world, but we're his plan A and his plan B when it comes to reaching people that are far from him. I need you to understand that there are people right now in the city of Port St. Lucie that if God is not able to get a hold of them, they will spend eternity in hell. I just want you to sit in that for just a minute. There are people that are not connected to the family right now. They think they're living, but they're not actually living. They're dying. They're headed towards an eternal cliff that leads nowhere. It leads to emptiness and darkness for the rest of eternity. Eternity is a long time. And when it comes to us as the church, we're his plan A and his plan B for who he wants to use to help reach those people. But what we oftentimes do as Christians is we sit back and we will watch people drive off the cliff. And in some cases, we wave to them bye-bye. Okay. You got people in your job that you know they're headed towards hell. And you wave at them as they go bye-bye. They're neighbors of yours. Okay, let me bring it home for a minute. There are people in your household that you know are about to drive off the eternal cliff. 
God wants to make them a part of the family, but he wants to use you to bring them in. If you make the choice to do what so many Christians do, which is they say, you know what, no big deal, I'm saved, <laughs> I made it, then they're going to miss out on eternity. They're going to miss out on spending eternity in heaven with Jesus. What if, what if what scripture says is true? What if a person doesn't give their heart to Jesus and they spend eternity in hell burning? What if? So this series, over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about what we need to do to step out and reach out to people who are far from God and help bring them into the family. I believe God wants them there. God wants them to be a part of the family. Let me say this and then I'm going to close. So here I am, I'm an atheist. I'm in college. I don't want to have anything to do with God. I don't want to have anything to do with his church. There's a guy that I had worked with who went and started a business. And the business blew up just like that. And so here I am, I'm in college, I am broken. Now I think I have it going on. Which by the way, when you're lost, <laughs> you think you're doing great. I'm broken. And he can see it. And so he says to me, he says, hey, um, I told him, I said, I need a job. You know, I'm, I'm living on ramen noodles, I'm broke, I need a job. And he says, man, listen, I'll give you a job, but you got to go to church with me. And I was like, no, nah, I ain't going to church. You got to understand, like, I'm, a, I'm an atheist. I don't do that whole church stuff. And so he says, no, no, no. If, if I'm going to give you a job, you got to go to church with me. So then I go home to my wife, who at the time was my girlfriend, and I said, hey, uh, this guy is willing to give me a job. But he says, in order for me to get the job, I'm gonna go, I got to go to church with him. And she says, well, we're going to be going to church this weekend then because you, you broke. Because you broke. And uh, you need a job. So make a long story short, that Sunday we went to church. And uh, it changed everything. It changed everything. I wish I could tell you that I gave my heart to Jesus that first day. I did it was three months because I was real skeptical. Three months later, I gave my heart to Jesus. And for the past 20 years, like I told you in the beginning of my message, I've been walking with him. Here's the question I have for you. What if your neighbor is the next me? What if it's the person in your household? What if it's your family? What if it's the coworker at work? What if it's the person at the grocery store that you're often talking about? What if God's wanting to do in their life what he did in my life? We're no longer going to just wave bye-bye as people who are drive off the cliff. We're going to do everything we possibly can to be the church, to bring hope to the hopeless, to help see the broken restored, and to see lives transformed. Amen. As we close the day, there are two, there are two groups that I want to pray for. The first group are uh, those of us in here that if you were honest, you haven't really done the best job of actually being the church. Like you've come to church consistently. You hear the word. You know the word. You can, re you can recite scripture backwards and forwards. But you haven't quite done the best job of actually being the church. That's the first group I want to pray for. The second group I want to pray for are those of you in here who you've never actually committed your life to Jesus. You've been coming to church, but if you were to die tomorrow, you don't really know whether you're going to spend eternity in heaven with him. I believe that God wants to give you assurance today. And all you have to do is pray this prayer. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, Jesus, we've heard your word today, God. We thank you for it. God, I pray that you would help us to live this out, God. We don't just want to hear the word. We want to be doers of the word. We want to be the church. We don't just want to come to church. We want to be the church. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're in here today and, and you would say, man, I, I haven't quite done the best job of 
actually being the church. I know scripture. I've been a part of churches, in some cases for 20, 30, 40 years. But I haven't done the best job of actually being the church. Could, could you do me a favor? Could you raise your hands high for me, please, all around this room? Come on, raise them high. Raise them high. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus' hands are raised all across this room. God, there are people in this room that are saying, God, I love you. But if we were honest, we haven't always done the best job of being the church. Reaching out to those that love us, that care about us. We haven't done the best job of communicating your word to them, inviting them to church, and helping them to find hope. And so, God, we pray that by your power, by your spirit, that, God, you would help us walk into a new season, God, where we do everything we possibly can. to reach those that are far from you, Jesus. The second group I want to pray for are those in here who would say, I, I don't really know Jesus. If I, if I were honest, I, I don't really have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe grandma's prayed for you. Your spouse has prayed for you. But you never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior in your life. And because of that, you don't really know where you're going to spend eternity. I want you to know that God wants more for you. So what all you have to do, according to Scripture, is believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. And so in a second, I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to simply raise your hands high, affirming that this is the day going to walk into newfound relationship with Jesus once and for all. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Jesus, I want to know you. I need you in my life. I can't do this thing without you, God. The things that are on the inside of me that are broken, I need you to heal them. Transform me. Change me from the inside out. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. We're all going to pray this prayer, but if today is your day where you would say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I can't do this thing without you. I want you to pray this just a little bit louder than everybody else. Here we go. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make me a new person from the inside out. I believe that you died on the cross to save me of my sins. And it's because of that sacrifice that I will follow you for the rest of my days. I want to be a Christian, a true follower of yours. Help me to grow from this day forward. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we give a huge round of applause to everybody that prayed that prayer?